Welcome to topic 7.13, Origins of Life on Earth. Earth remains the only place in the universe known to harbor life. Studying the question about where life came from and answering it in a scientific way is probably one of the most challenging questions that any branch of science deals with. But despite those challenges, there are a couple of prevailing hypotheses that attempt to answer it using evidence. We're going to be exploring those hypotheses in this video, but before we do, let's take a quick detour and learn about how the Earth itself was formed. Around 4.6 billion years ago, a swirling mass of dust, the remnants of an interstellar cloud, began to coalesce on itself due to gravity. At the center, gravity pulled more and more material in. Eventually, the pressure in the core was so great that hydrogen atoms began to combine via nuclear fusion, forming helium and releasing tremendous amounts of energy, and our sun was born. Matter farther out in the disk was also clumping together. These clumps smashed into one another, forming larger and larger objects. Some of them grew big enough for their gravity to shape them into spheres, becoming planets, dwarf planets, and large moons. In other cases, planets did not form. The asteroid belt is made of bits and pieces of the early solar system that could never quite come together into a planet. Other, smaller leftover pieces became asteroids, comets, meteoroids, and small irregular moons. The order and arrangement of the planets and other bodies in our solar system is due to the way that the solar system formed. Nearest the sun, only rocky material could withstand the heat when the solar system was young. For this reason, the first four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are terrestrial planets. They're small with solid rocky surfaces. Meanwhile, materials we're used to seeing as ice, liquid, or gas settled in the outer regions of the young solar system. Gravity pulled these materials together, and that is where we find the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn, and ice giants like Uranus and Neptune. Although early Earth would have been far too inhospitable for any life to exist, obviously things changed. One of the main hypotheses that deals with the formation of life on Earth has to do with the concept that organic molecules could have been formed in an inorganic way. Two researchers named Oparin and Haldane independently came up with an idea that spotlighted the constituents of Earth's early atmosphere. The atmosphere as we know it has a high concentration of oxygen in it. Oxygen's presence makes the atmosphere an oxidizing one, more likely to accept electrons, not donate them. But Earth's early atmosphere would have been a reducing one due to the fact that no oxygen was present. That reducing atmosphere would have lent itself well to the donation of electrons, necessary in the formation of larger and more complex molecules. They hypothesized that lightning, ultraviolet radiation, or even thermal energy could have provided the necessary energy to trigger reactions between small, simple molecules to form those relatively larger, more complex ones. It wasn't until nearly 20 years later, in the 1950s, when Stanley Miller and Harold Urey put the oparin haldane hypothesis to the test. They were able to show that organic molecules, including ones that are used to build biomolecules like proteins and nucleic acids, could be formed abiotically, without life. Long after the original Miller-Urey experiments of nearly 70 years ago, extensions of their work in laboratories around the world have provided even more validity of Oparin and Haldane's original idea. Scientists have been able to show that abiotic synthesis of compounds can yield dozens of kinds of amino acids, the purines and pyrimidines of nucleic acids, and other organic acids. In 2019, French scientists were able to demonstrate the abiotic synthesis of most of the intermediates of the Krebs cycle. We're going to take a look at a short animation that will help to illustrate the original Miller-Urey experiments.
In the 1920s, Oparin and Haldane hypothesized that the atmosphere of the primitive Earth contained gases, such as nitrogen, ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and hydrogen. Oxygen did not become a part of the atmosphere until the advent of photosynthesis millions of years later. It was further hypothesized that under these conditions, organic molecules could be formed if there were a source of energy such as electricity from storms or ultraviolet radiation from the sun. In 1953, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey tested this hypothesis. They constructed a closed system with a reservoir for water, sampling ports, a chamber for the input of electrical energy, and a condenser to convert the water vapor back to a liquid. The researchers then added water, hydrogen gas, methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and nitrogen. The water was heated to form a vapor, and electrical sparks were generated to mimic lightning. This apparatus simulated the possible conditions of the early Earth. When the water was analyzed after one week, they found simple carbon compounds such as formaldehyde and hydrogen cyanide. These compounds then combined to produce formic acid, urea, and amino acids. In similar experiments carried out over the next several years, various organic compounds have been synthesized. These experiments show that simple organic compounds, including the building blocks of proteins and other macromolecules, could be formed from gases present in the primitive atmosphere with the input of electrical energy. A second hypothesis, called panspermia, suggests that organic molecules weren't formed here on Earth, but in fact were formed elsewhere and then transported to Earth via something like an asteroid impact. There is evidence to support this hypothesis as well. In 2015, the biotic remains of living things were discovered in Australia, dating back to when the Earth was only about 400 million years old. A meteorite that fell to Earth in 1969 brought with it a collection of various organic compounds. Analysis of the 7 billion year old 100 kilogram Murchison meteorite has identified over 15 amino acids, purine and pyrimidine compounds, and a number of other organic molecules. The specimen demonstrates that many organic compounds could have been delivered to Earth by early solar system bodies and may have played a key role in the origin of life here. In 2018, scientists discovered that there was DNA from living things on the outside of the International Space Station. It's discoveries like these that suggest organic molecules, including genetic material, could in fact survive travel in space. However it was that those organic molecules formed, both hypotheses suggest that those organic molecules would have naturally collected in certain places on Earth, like in deep sea vents or at shorelines. Research from a scientist named Sidney Fox in the 1950s and 60s demonstrated that those organic molecules would self-assemble and self-polymerize to form polypeptide structures. We also know that phospholipids will spontaneously arrange into structures similar to a cell membrane. This would have provided for the establishment of an internal environment relative to the outside. That internal environment could have served as a protection for some of those early organic molecules. One of the most important functions of life is the passage of life-propagating genetic information from one generation of living things to the next. In most cases, modern organisms and their ancestors rely on DNA to store and transmit genetic information. But some of the earliest forms of life, back four billion years, are believed to have used RNA as genetic material. As a matter of fact, the discovery of ribose traveling on meteorites through space is one piece of evidence to suggest that. As a molecule, RNA also has the ability to self-replicate, to form peptide bonds between amino acids, and it even has enzymatic properties. All of these demonstrate the fact that RNA could have existed in the absence of DNA. 
RNA, though, due to its chemical properties, is more susceptible to certain kinds of damage and is more reactive than DNA. The uracil in RNA is more stable in an oxygen-free environment, like that of early Earth. Ribose, the sugar present in RNA's backbone, contains an additional oxygen atom, making it more reactive and more prone to hydrolysis than its cousin found in DNA, deoxyribose. RNA would have been sufficient for early, short-lived, simpler forms of life. But for other, more complex forms of life to exist, like the ancestors of modern organisms, that would have required a more stable, more long-lasting molecule, like DNA. And that's the end of this topic. Thanks for watching. Take care.